Hi, my name is Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. Okay, so I've got a little bit of a challenge. Over the last several days, I have been sharing some video clips from the Vega reactors. And here is uh, the uh, blog at uh, remoteview.substack.com uh, or remoteview.icu. And uh, this is the first one that I was talking about. And there's a terrible GIF animation. Uh, anime of it here and what you can see is that this looks like one that was not even spotted by the author of this image that is Ken Shoulders um, and I pointed this out I've then gone and found subsequent to that uh, first presentation where I showed that spiraling track I found this uh, multiply twisted tracks and this for me um, explains the sideways M M M or even the IMI tracks um, uh, potentially with a slightly different configuration and I uh, showed the animation of it here and you can download the uncompressed non gif animations and it looks like it would explain this one by um, Dmitry Baranov as I discussed and I also um, shared this uh, on the day that I'm recording this which was a video that I would already previously shared where we have track 1a and 2a on the A camera and uh, 1B and 2B on the B camera. So 1A is the equivalent track of 1B and 2A is the equivalent track of 2B. And uh, the actual video of it, uh, which you can click down here and uh, look at it on YouTube uh, with a slow motion as well at uh, 1 30th of the speed, it shows that the, the tracks effectively, are, whilst starting at a slightly different time, have essentially the same or very similar kind of um, travel distance in uh, a single 1 60th of a second frame. However, uh, track two has almost like one sort of a kind of twist on it, whereas there's three or even maybe four twists in a particular frame, even though, as I say, the, the traveling distance isn't any different and the diameter of them look pretty similar. So I looked at this one, which I shared in the last presentation, which is this um, uh, clip or from um, the Lutzietna condensed plasmoids paper. And this is uh, from, I think, the French researchers down in Nantes, uh, Duval, I think his name is. And uh, if you take the clip, um, the video um, section here, and I uh, have what I've done in this bit here, I've uh, scaled it uh, three times so we can have a closer look at it and just rotated it so it's kind of straight in line so I can arrange it next to the um, the vowel uh, track. Uh, what I'm saying is that um, you can have them the same width and the same velocity but a different number of twists going on uh, within a path of travel. So to simulate that, all I did in this one to match this was uh, stretch it along the length or, or rather compress it along the length of the track but not change its width. And that gave me um, something that looks extremely similar to this track. Now bear in mind that the tracks that you're observing here are moving in three dimensions whereas this track is on a witness material and is constrained to a certain extent to two dimensions. Although you can see in the track above that if you imagine it's trying to spin around well it kind of achieves it here and it sort of semi achieves it here um, but most of the time it's stuck uh, not not able to spin and that kind of makes sense because you know they can spin at different speeds but uh, they might have a desire to spin at a fast rate anyway I, I believe that this particular type of track explains this this particular type of uh, 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 exotic vacuum object structure explains uh, the Baranoff track and other tracks some tracks that we've seen and uh, the the, the t typical sort of slanted M tracks and uh, this one is the sort of more standard sort of spiral gap tracks which I uh, suggest might be explained by something like this. However, um, uh, what I'd like you to do is to look into the literature and um, try and find any strange radiation tracks types that haven't already been explained. And what I will do is I actually think we already have enough Vega videos uh, and data 
uh, to find uh, multiple examples of each type of um, engine or machining tool you might like to think of it for the observed tracks the sort of standard sort of straight tracks and uh, we've already shown the divergent tracks and the, the, the splitting and coming together and I'm going to try and uh, give you better examples of those from the data that we have and there's more data coming in from both Henk and Dave and so I, uh, this is a bit of a challenge for everyone um, what I want you to do is to go into the literature as I said uh, from po possibly uh, um, Shoulders, Matsumoto, uh, uh, Leonid Derodskiev, uh, Sabatimova, um, all of these different authors and see if you can find these kind of long tracks um, that haven't already been explained by the videos that we've shared and I will endeavour to put together examples uh, um, of the formations of these uh, uh, exotic vacuum objects that might have uh, synthesized the track um, that is being uh, proposed. And so um, just looking at the condensed plasmoids paper here, um, th these are kind of like straight impacts of mushrooms in my, my view. Um, I will actually deal with the ring traces in separate uh, videos. So I'm not looking for these kind of ring traces. We saw very similar things on already on the vibrator plates of uh, uh, Roya Shinamaza. Um, but there are examples of ring structures. I mentioned one in the previous video to this um, where it kind of hit the plate and came up towards the camera and it got energized uh, in the same way that the squiggle got energized when it touched the cathode, uh, grabbing a load of electrons one might imagine off that rich copper rich brass. Um, however, uh, it's the more the tracks, uh, the, these are the merging and splitting tracks and we dealt with those but I'll give more examples of that. It's more these rail like tracks and that, that uh, I'm interested uh, in dealing with at this stage and um, uh, there are these kind of tubes. Um, we've, we've dealt with these in the past and we've seen these on um, the Lion Reactor and so you know th that's probably been dealt with. So it, these spiral tracks uh, these kind of tracks, I think this is by uh, Savatomova and Rodinov as well. So what I will do is I'll this this is the kind of track here that I'm saying uh, is likely to be produced by a similar structure to the one that you are seeing um, here. Uh, this kind of structure, if you imagine that going across a surface, I believe that it would produce these kind of uh, observations and also variants on those would produce these kind of observations so um, we'll, we'll go through uh, then there's the more sort of helical tracks here and I, I, I've got a good selection of um, uh, uh, material I believe that I can explain these and these are their sort of IMI tracks we saw a lot of these kind of tracks on on the um, uh, vibrator pl plates of uh, um, Roy Shinamaza these kind of uh, ones uh, will give examples of that and uh, here's a, a group selection um, of quasi-periodic tracks. Anyway, so um, the, the point being is that um, I think and have said since uh, probably early 2000 or certainly in 2017 that I, I believe that uh, Lena is caused by these structures. Uh, they are the active agent in Lena. Uh, and they are uh, exotic vacuum objects and you have now I believe uh, with the work of Henk and Dave and the analysis that I've done uh, you, you can see exactly how they're forming within uh, a highly energetic state. Now in the case of uh, John Hutchison he was obviously creating these uh, room temperature I would call this definitely <laughs> cold fusion uh, and th the point is is that um, where, where we've moved on is that this is actually a coherent matter uh, uh, body and that as such it can be created at any temperature so you can create very cold cold fusion and I think the the most cold fusion that I think is in the uh, body of work that this field has produced I'd probably say was the August 1989 finding of uh, Francesco Piantelli where he had a nickel rod and he had a brain cell I think from a mouse and he was testing the uh, ability of uh, um, various chemicals to block the mechanisms by which 
when brain cells uh, are starved of oxygen they start to die and they produce a chemical to protect themselves and if, it, if it's left too long the chemical prevents reoxygenation of the cell and he would keep it stimuli stimulated by an electric pulse and then he would flood it with uh, near liquid or very extremely cold like I think you can get down to nearly 4 Kelvin uh, liquid helium or, or um, ice cold helium and what that is suggesting to me is that in that very first case that gave Piantelli his uh, um, nickel hydrogen uh, initiation in an actual biology experiment, this really was cold fusion and it was a coherent structure. So that, that basically the electrical charge go, uh, uh, stimulation was going into the, um, the, uh, the uh, nickel and he was flooding the chamber where the brain cell was held with hydrogen in order to basically get rid of all of the oxygen. And the nickel, therefore, was catalytically splitting the hydrogen and in combination with the electric uh, uh, buildup maybe in there and the nickel uh, being this catalysis and, and providing a a um, platform for the formation of condensate. I believe that when when it was he was putting in the helium, he was um, uh, stimulating the production of a coherent state, and this produced the boiling. That he, and it was I think 250 watts or something of cryogenic cooling was continuously being removed, and uh, event eventually it broke the cryogenic apparatus, and so. I think Piantello really is, in, in August 1989, is almost the quintessential definition of cold fusion. And obviously with, with Shul, uh, uh, John Hutchison in 1979, a uh, full 10 years before that, he is showing still cold fusion. And I would argue that the temperatures that are being achieved in these, uh, or certainly the bulk te temperatures being achieved in these Vega experiments are still cold fusion but not room temperature and not cryogenic fusion but as I said with coherent matter you can create this phenomena at any temperature even in stars even in supernova you just need the matter to be the same and uh, in the same wavelength and in phase and I think uh, with that I'll say good night. Uh, so hopefully I've fixed the sound test here and we'll be good to go on the next live stream. But please go out into the literature, dig around, see what you can find and uh, uh, go into the re most recent RemoteView.ICU blog and propose uh, any particular tracks that you would like to see uh, explained by the Vega video data. Thank you very much for your time and I will see you in the next video.